I was a bit lost. I wanted to turn my life around. I knew I didn't want that life anymore. I wanted to get out of prison. John has a mud story. <clears throat> I met John at an event I went to for young people. Ian Wright was there, but John McAvoy was the one that low-key the kids were getting the most excited about. Like, they were like, oh, have you heard his story? At 16 years old, I bought a sawn-off shotgun off a 40-year-old man in a car park in Dulwich. So John grew up uh, influenced heavily by the men around him who were involved in criminal networks. He ended up being arrested, getting convicted for armed robbery and going to prison. He went to Belmarsh. But not just to Belmarsh, he went to the prison within the prison where they keep high-risk prisoners, like Abu Hamza, which I, I only know about that because of the Ross Kemp documentary. I don't think I could do an hour in here without going around the twist. So there were two key events which led to John completely turning his life around. One of them was the death of his friend Aaron. So whilst he was in prison, his friend Aaron was committing a crime, there was a car accident and he passed away. And the second thing that happened was he started rowing in the prison gym. He met a guy called Darren, who was a prison guard working in the gym, who encouraged him massively in kind of pursuing higher goals, even to breaking world records, like the longest distance road in 24 hours. And he did that whilst in prison, he broke that world record. Since leaving prison, he's decided to take on Iron Men challenges, which involves intense running, cycling and swimming but it's also led to him advising government policy, talking about prison reform, and going out to speak to young people, talking to them about his story, trying to teach them that there are different opportunities out there and that they have to claim ownership of their own story. No matter how bad things get, don't ever quit. Loads of these themes link into the things that our audience have asked us to speak about around masculinity, from role models to prison, to mental health and mentality. So I decided to go meet him at the London Rowing Club in Putney because that's where he went the day after he was released from prison. So this is the rostrum of all the athletes that have been to the Olympics and World Championships that are rowed at this club. There's about 100. And you come here every day? Every day, um, seven days a week normally. Have you ever been to a rowing club before? A rowing club? Yeah. I have done it actually. Oh, you have? I have. And here's the gym. What made you come to, a, to decide to row? When you're in prison, everyone gets three gym sessions per week. There was a guy and he was rowing a million metres for charity. And he said to me, if you say to the prison officers that you want to row for charity, they'll let you come down here as much as you want. And it gave me clearance to leave the wing to come down to the gym seven days a week. The first session I ever done, I rowed 32,000 metres, which was 20 miles. And I just remember looking at the monitor, these numbers were in front of me, and everyone left me alone. I could have been anywhere in the world. This was my form of escapism and being able to get out of that place mentally, even though I was trapped in it physically. And then I rode three million metres in three months, and then the prisoner said to me, do realise if you row five million metres, that's equivalent to rowing across the Atlantic. And I thought, that's quite a cool thing to say I've done on the rowing machine. And it was then Darren Davis, the prison officer, he looked at the monitor and went, that is so fast. And then he, he planted the seed in my head. I was 26 years old at this point, and I'd never had a man, a male in my life, that had no vested interest. Every person I'd ever been around or looked up to, they, there was always an agenda. So, so they it, weren't looking at you no, and no, what would be good no. for you? It was, it was what was good for them. So it was the fact that... I could make them money. I could do stuff that would make them financially better off. I and mean, nearly all of them was all involved in criminality and negative, um, negative way of living a lifestyle, basically. Is there a way that you're comfortable to say, to say what kind of things that, that would be? I remember being in Crystal Palace and watching a film and the film was made about my uncle and my uncle committed the biggest armed robbery in the world and he stole 26 million pounds worth of gold bullion. Let's go. My uncle was in prison for 26 years for that offence. I didn't see that as a kid. I saw him sitting on 26 million pounds worth of gold bullion in a Hollywood film. When you've got those sorts of people telling a young boy, the system's corrupt, the government's corrupt, politicians are corrupt, the banks are corrupt, and then you see a corrupt system, and it's like, I'm not gonna be a victim of that system. 
it 100% started affecting my psychology. It's so profound and powerful when you say it because when you feel like there's a sense of corruption in the system, there's not many people who are out there offering options to them and opportunities. And what you just say, it just hits the nail on the head for so many examples of so many people I've spoken to. I might mention that upstairs, we could probably continue the conversation. When growing up, who were your main influences? The one that I'd say was the key to the door was my mum's ex-husband, Billy. He'd just finished serving 16 years for armed robbery. One day, me and my stepdad was in a car. I was 12 years old, we were driving through Bromley, and he said to me, look out the window. And I looked out, and I said, what? He went, see all these people, they're all sheep. And I said, what do you mean? He went, they're all sheep. And he, he basically was saying, they go to work every day, they pay taxes, and they're slaves to the system. I couldn't fathom how someone would get up and go to work every day and give the government 40% of their wages and salaries. I couldn't fathom it. It does always come back, I think, a lot of this stuff down to childhood. If you plant a seed in, in poisonous soil, the tree's not going to grow. What were you like back then compared to how you are now? I imagine you knew being a little bit cocky. I really, really wasn't. I really wasn't. I, I didn't want to grow up and be a gangster. It wasn't, didn't motivate me. I just wanted to be successful. I wanted to have money. It's interesting when you say that though. When you say to me, I just wanted to be successful, that is what so many men I speak to say. And I think it's really hard for people to find their place in a world where there's not a lot of people reaching out. It was a very hyper masculine alpha male environment. It was literally, you show no weakness, you do not break, you do not relent. Hello. Darren very kindly came down from Nottingham at very short notice to be part of this interview. Hey, thanks for coming. I just felt it was like really important to speak to him because it was that friendship and relationship that developed between John and Darren, which ultimately led to John being able to turn his life around. That was through Darren encouraging him, uh, not just on a sporting level, but also on like a personal level. That trust between them was something that definitely John attributes to, you know, massively changing the trajectory of his life. I guess I just want from your perspective, how you met each other, what your first impressions were. You have to understand this. Darren was my enemy. For someone like me that was involved in that level of crime, around those sorts of criminals, to suddenly then start having relationships with a prison officer. People would have classed me as an informer, a grass, I'd broken, the system had broken me. Once you do that, you don't go back. Were you also very aware of, of that being the context? <clears throat> I'm aware of the position that I'm in as a prison officer, but I don't see any harm in me spending time with John and talking about some of my experiences. It's like something within me saying that he's got something he can change his life, he can use this. What was motivating you? It's just the way I am. You know, it's the way my mum and dad brought me up. You know, it's to, it's to support others and, and see potential in others. And everybody's got the same ability to change. It's giving people time and, and being positive to them and saying to them, you can do it. There's so much that seems to come back to the idea though of isolation, but what you're saying essentially is like, time is what you invest in somebody yeah. to show them they've got value. Yeah. But that's what, that's what it's all about though, isn't it? If I'm going to see any of the guys, I will go out of my way and I'll go and speak to them face to face. That is important. And it's so simple. Like and it's so simple. People don't realise. It's so simple. How powerful that is. Yeah. It can make a huge difference to somebody's life. Is that something that in the prison system is kind of also discouraged for whatever reason as well? Yeah, I would say so. It comes down to like a, a culture thing of changing the culture of the prison service. The prison system should see prison officers as like the person of change like that role model for these people to turn their lives around. Nearly all the men I ever saw as a kid that got out of prison, they come out even more damaged and even more violent and even more driven to, to sort of express that hatred towards the system again and attack it and keep attacking it. If you hadn't met Darren, like... I honestly can't tell you. I definitely wouldn't have gone back to prison, I don't think, but I don't know where and how I would have ended up being today. So while we focus mostly on uh, what happened to John before, I think it's what happened to him when he left prison, the attitude he kind of took with him outside and how he decided to affect the world that he lives in, which is probably the most impressive part of the story. And when I went on my first parole hearing, the judge said to me, your release plan is not based in reality and you're a dreamer. Today I'm standing in front of you, the only Nike sponsored Ironman athlete in the world. Once people fall into like committing crime and then going to prison, it feels very much like you're 
a lost cause in some people's eyes once you've done that? Do you think that's like how society sees uh, people? Uh, yeah, I do, because I, I experienced it myself. You have that stigma that a leopard never changes its spots. I was ashamed of what I did years ago because my life dramatically changed so much. I was very nervous about being ostracised, from especially joining this rowing club. Because I thought they would judge me and then they wouldn't want me to be in their social circles and be friends with them and stuff. How did that come about you, the kind of revealing what your story was, your background? For the first six months I was here, like, I was just known as like John, that, that guy that, that was a very good athlete. I had never told anyone about anything I'd ever done on a rowing machine because I was so worried someone would Google me. No one really knew. So you couldn't tell people that you'd broken a world no, no, record? No, 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 no. And I found out basically one person did discover I went to prison. And then I thought, right, I need to reclaim control of this. So I wrote a blog. And the blog kind of went viral within rowing. 100% of it was completely supported, all the way up to the head of British rowing. Do you want to kind of explain a little bit of what you've done to kind of use that as a tool for getting out to other communities and other people? But when I very first got out of prison, I was so consumed with being a really good athlete. Everything I've spoken about up to this point, in fact, it's always been about me. It's always been about creating a legacy. And, and my moment of realisation was going back to when I started going to schools and seeing and hearing horrific stories about how young people and people in general were being failed by the system. By the system yeah. that you, you kind of yeah. uh, like had been almost kind of indoctrinated against in a way Since when I you were younger. Kid. And I just thought to myself, I'm not going to be a bystander and, and watch these people being failed so bad. Like I, I haven't got millions of followers and stuff, but it's very difficult for someone to sit across the table from me and say, what you're saying is nonsense. I am the proof you shouldn't give up on people. And I think that gives me a very strong platform and it has had a big impact. Like park runs now in prison, football programmes are going in prison, rugby programmes are going in prison. Legacy, in reality, isn't money and it isn't medals and it isn't how fast I can run a marathon. My legacy will be, it will be the people's lives I've affected in a positive manner. Their kids' lives will be better and their kid kids' life will be better and it will go on and on and on. And that's reality of life. Like that chain will go on from me being six foot in the ground. And that's what legacy genuinely is. Because it doesn't mean anything else other than that. Because we're all going to end up in the same hole and that's the end of that. So much of what John and Darren have spoken about links directly to common themes which have come up throughout the, both the series that we've done on masculinity. And I just found it really uh, positive just to speak to him about his own experience. Um, yeah, I think that's an, a really big part of what the series is about. It's about finding people who have found a way through difficult times and he is a perfect example of that. So I hope you've enjoyed this um, and we do, like I say, have at least one more episode coming up. So if you want to step say what we're doing, make sure you like, comment and subscribe. We'll just like put it on the screen. Like I don't want to say it anymore. <laughs>